Okay, so thank you very much. I'm very uh, happy to be here with this uh, wonderful opportunity and this uh, great book. No? So I would uh, speak about three main things where I see some sort of multidimensional uh, understanding of law. I think multidimensionality is the key concept in this book, not least in the way I read it. And I, I really think that it provides uh, for a lot of uh, impulse in different debates. I hope that I can also share this uh, enthusiasm with you. So my <coughs> presentation is divided in the following parts. I will be very brief in each of them. Just uh, very quickly, what, do, how do I think that multidimensionality works out? Then uh, I go through legal reasoning, legal perspectives, legal pluralism, basically the whole title of the abstract. No? And then uh, what do I think is the takeaway of multidimensional law as one and many? So multidimensionality, I, I would start uh, with a different example uh, than the ones provided already, very rich ones uh, by Jorge Nunez. But how does multidimensionality, why is it uh, so important? Well, let's go back to the debate on fragmentation, or maybe to the current debates. No? Uh, where do we find some sort of unjust status quo? Well, I think the critique of investor state uh, arbitration, it, it can be mapped into this way, that it's some sort of fragmentation, unidimensionality, only a tunnel vision, where, of course, uh, states, they want to attract foreign investors. And to do this, well, they create a basically a whole new regime, and they uh, stipulate that there won't be any judicial precedents, it will be entirely decentralized with private adjudicators. Of course, this is changing, you know, and there are also some institutions, then in the European Union it's different now, but in principle this is the idea still in many regimes of, uh, based on bilateral investment treaties or other contracts, no? There you have your own, uh, as our critique says, special rights for special uh, people. And uh, they say, well, these special rights, they are actually helping perpetuate these patterns of colonial exploitation that are still in the map of capital. No? So in a way, this is, I think, a very tangible uh, example of how uh, the unidim unidimensional perspective is very explicitly embraced, even institutionalized, um, not only by states, but also by lobby groups or by capital in general. No? So what would be a change? I think that if we take seriously a multidimensional perspective, then we would be forced actually to acknowledge at least this pluralism of pluralisms. Who are the affected? Who are the communities understanding? Not only the investor rights, but also the debate on investor obligations or the integration with other regimes, especially in climate impact. Or of course, if we are taking a multidimensional perspective, then how can we provide a good argument to ignore judicial precedents when it's a very similar case that was uh, already decided in another, uh, in another setting. No? So the way that I understand multidimensionality, uh, I hope I represented it well, is this type of sh shift. With a unidimensional perspective, first one chooses a discipline or doctrine because I think that Jorge Nunez does not delimit to disciplines, but also comprehensive doctrines in a way, no? In the multidimensional perspective, instead, it's a problem that we want to solve. And not only, ah, well, I'm a private lawyer, so I will only look at what my discipline is debating now, no? But actually, I think there is a problem here with this type of, I don't know, divorce or marriage institution or things like that, no? In this, one can change the examples. Second step in the unidimensional perspective, it's the positioning of the scholar, Nunez says. They apply the methodology, and then things follow pretty straightforwardly. But in the multidimensional perspective, there is a still a previous intermediate stage, which would be, OK, I am knowledge, the pluralism of pluralisms, and maybe uh, we are not always in the position to make a very uh, rich and interdisciplinary investigation, but at least we can <coughs> use it as a sort of reflection no? to, to then say, well, there is this pluralism of dimensions, and 
I will apply this perspective, but I acknowledge that this has a way to be applied or integrated with the broader question. So I think this is an important uh, methodological shift. And let's see three contexts very quickly. First, in legal reasoning. Jorge Nunez, uh, among the many things he does in this book, he applies the theory of Carlos Cosio in the international and law beyond the state realm. And it's very interesting uh, how he applies a dialectical phenomenology but I also think that in passages such as this, it can also throw light in debates even on grounding in, an, in analytical metaphysics and so on. Because he speaks about how there is a materiality, the facts of the case of a problem, no? One can change uh, the type of example, but then beyond this <coughs> materiality, there is the experience of the meaning. This experience could be some sort of shared uh, social understanding. So one thing is the material as the clay. Another thing is this shared social meaning as, well, the uh, work of art by, I don't know, the David, no? And then, uh, not only that, it's not only grounding, but Jorge Nunez says, well, in the realm that you are interested in, in law and this type of problems culturally, actually it goes back and forth. It's not only uh, one way. But then when we have this sort of understanding, it says it goes uh, back, no? the meaning in also in the substrate. So then the key passage is, the same thing happens when a judge rolls in a, rules in, on a case. So then dialectical phenomenology becomes important in legal reasoning. And he has, a, I think, a very pregnant uh, short passage here. No? The judge considers the case in its full circumstances discerns the existing law applicable to the circumstances, analyzes if and how the lie applies to the facts of the case, and then determines the outcome of the case based on these factors. So this could, maybe we could modify this uh, description also to fit a unidimensional perspective. But I think it's more akin to the multidimensional one. And I present this type of table to compare them because again, one starts from the facts, the dispute of the case, then one wonders, okay, which type of law am I going to apply? So it's not first the sources or not first the formal considerations on validity, but actually some sort of justice related claim. No? And with this, I am moving a little bit closer to uh, my suggestion towards the end on interlegality perspective. But, and then the outcome, well, it has to acknowledge actually th these factors. So it's a process based, I understand, or procedural reason giving a sort of charge, no? a burden that the judge has. It's not only about the outcome, but especially about how we reach this outcome, how we justify, how we provide sufficient reasons. And these sufficient reasons are not only the ones of my chosen doctrine, of my chosen uh, discipline, but they are of the affected person, of the players, of the roles they have, and of course of how the, the problem can be solved or not. Uh, one example uh, beyond interlegality could be the concept of intersectionality, actually, because um, I think I won't go all into the uh, Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, a general recommendation 28, but that's the place where the concept up until some years, philosophical concept of intersectionality was applied and recommended to the states so that uh, one takes some sort of uh, vertice based or how the different types of discrimination, different types of uh, inequality, of systemic uh, deficiencies, they not only are added to each other, but they build upon each other and then it's an important task of the judge to make uh, special measures to stop this sort of uh, up affectation to the people, no? so that they can do appropriate uh, measures to not make this continue. And the other uh, place where I think in legal reasoning a multidimensional uh, thought goes on is in interlegality, but I will speak a bit about this later. Uh, just now I would say that it's the recognition of how norms from different uh, legal orders or even regulative orders, they apply to one same case. 
And then comes the question, okay, how can I avoid this regarding a complete set of uh, norms, which actually the subjects already uh, are expecting to be applied. So I would uh, disappoint their legitimate expectations and I would be in that sense arbitrary. No? So interlegality has also this sort of rule of law based uh, normative um, argument. Then on legal perspectives, uh, here I would depart from the well-known uh, distinction of the participant's perspective and the observer's perspective, which is maybe not the same, but it's very similar to the internal and external point of view of Hart. No? But for Alexi, the participant's perspective, they argue about what is the correct uh, deontic position, what, is, what should be, no? uh, either forbidden, per, uh, permitted, or obligatory. And an observer, they would just almost as a thing of regularities. No? Okay, how does this happen? But I won't make a normative argument for it. So this has already been uh, very used in legal philosophy and I think it still throws light. But there are some questions, some critiques which uh, this distinction faces. Among them I find uh, quite inspiring the one by Carsten Heidemann in an article from 2005 who speaks about how this circle of possible claimants, if it's just about everyone who can take a stance and make a normative argument, then basically all of us are participants in any uh, legal order. No? So the judge or someone deciding, they must make another type of uh, further steps to determine who are, which are the relevant perspectives. And on the other hand, uh, Heidemann continues, well, uh, it seems obvious that the functions of just describing or interpreting norms and issuing norms should be distinguished with regard to the claim of correctness. Uh, and there's uh, more tools needed. So here the idea is uh, he presents some sort of way out. He says, well, one thing is to interpret norms and other things is to create law. But actually there, this becomes not a solution but an, a point of departure, I think, and this is where the multidimensional perspective uh, comes into hand. The initial questions would be, okay, what happens? Who are the relevant participants when there's, of course, disputed authorities? But also when we face private regulators, what about alternative dispute resolutions? What are the pragmatics? What are the type of uh, relevant arguments that one should take? Uh, what about content moderators in the internet? Or what about digitalization and the metaverse? Uh, should it be treated by a company? Should it be the state that uh, very actively regulates if this becomes some sort of second uh, world in the future? I think these are questions that are relevant in the present, no? now that we are doing this sort of uh, progressive change. So Jorge Muñez, uh, he already uh, mentioned it, he distinguishes four uh, roles that uh, players can take. Here I use participants just to uh, try to combine uh, theory. No? So he speaks about hosts as challenger and challenged, without uh, whom there would be no dispute. Uh, participants uh, whose influence is determined by the hosts, attendees, who actually, it, it seems to be a matter of degree because they don't have a significant part uh, cap capability to participate. And the viewers who can be neighbors, but they don't have the way to intervene. So actually my idea is that this type of perspective it complements very well with the internal ex external point of view or the participant and observer's perspective. Especially if we're going to debate about, okay, who should be the uh, dispute resolutor for theft that happens in a virtual world or for content moderation or other types of transnational law. It, it becomes very difficult to disentangle who are authorities and who are people with a contract, who are corporations uh, with so much power. No? And I think this type of uh, contribution will be very important, but at the moment I cannot say something more uh, concrete. And then, just finally, uh, to conclude, legal pluralism, I would uh, rather put it in terms of uh, interlegality, but of course it's important just to recognize. Jorge Nunez, throughout the book, recognizes the, that there is a pluralism of institutional sites of legal practices, both within and beyond the state, 
But at the same time, he proposes a universal law, which as has already been discussed, has a basic guarantees for all ultimate units of concern. So my suggestion and what I'm thinking about when I say multidimensional law is that one can speak of a universal design of the law. So it would be this sort of a top-down approach, uh, building new institutions, reforms, and so on, but also a universal application of the law. Already uh, another type of bottom-up approach maybe, in which already in this world, already in these jurisdictions that we now have, well, how can we integrate this uh, multidimensionality? Even if uh, we have some sort of formal rule that maybe the judge cannot uh, overcome, it would be important that the judge declares this and does not disregard at the outset the multidimensionality of the problem. No? So multidimensional law as one and many in conclusion, well, it will depend on the overall justifiability to the ultimate units of concern, whether these different types of legalities, uh, they can be acting uh, harmoniously, let's say, or whether the judging court would have to say, well, here is some sort of reason contestation, principle contestation. And I also think that this can uh, illuminate and open uh, some of the emerging questions in, in our world, no? especially in digitalization and law beyond the state. So thank you for uh, your attention.